who identify who the Salaf were of this Ummah, they use this ayat that Allah Ta'ala mentioned in Surah Tawbah, ayat number 100. And there are many other ayat. We have a lot to deal with. After that, we come to the authentic hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Alihi Wasallam. And that is the hadith that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Khayru nas qarni thumma alladhina yalunuhum thumma alladhina he said that the best people, the best people are the people who are from the generation that I'm in, me and my companions. They're the best people. And then the next generation after them, and then the next generation after them. And after describing these first three generations, which are the Salaf al Salih, he gave some descriptions of the people going to come after them. So we're not going to deal with that, but the point here is. This hadith clearly shows and illustrates that in this ummah, the best people from this ummah are the people who lived during the time of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. And this particular hadith, it has a lot of variations to it, like the one that Abu Huraira mentioned that was collected by Imam Muslim. The Messenger is of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, خَيْرُ أُمَّتِي الْقَرْنَ الَّذِي بُعِثْتُ فِيهِمْ the best of my ummah is the generation that I have been sent to. So this hadith is mutawatir because it comes in many chains of narrations. Many of the companions have narrated it and they've mentioned it. Not one, two, three, four, but a lot of those companions have mentioned this important hadith. So it's one of the hadith that are mutawatir. As Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah mentioned, al-Hafidh ibn Hajj al-Asqalani and other than that. So the point here is, that's who we mean and that's what we mean when we say the Salaf, the Salaf as salih That's what is intended and that's what is meant by that particular issue. Also, we have a few issues that we have to bring to your attention, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. And that is that the ulama of al-Islam, they also gave the meaning of this word in its linguistic sense. And that's important because if you're going to study the religion of Al-Islam, the religion of Al-Islam was revealed in the Arabic language. So if a person is going to understand the religion correctly, one of the tools that he needs is the Arabic language. But the Arabic language along with other issues. For an example, if a person wants to understand the religion, the Quran and the Sunnah, only using the Arabic language, he's going to be in trouble. Although the Prophet ﷺ, he spoke Arabic, his Sun is in Arabic, the Quran is in Arabic. If a person were to just use the Arabic language to give the tafsir of the Quran and the Hadith and to understand this religion, his understanding is going to be faulty. If a person were to use his intellect only to understand this religion, his understanding is going to be faulty. If he were to use dreams to understand this religion, it's going to be faulty. He has to use the understanding of what the companions were upon, Ridwanullah Alim Ajmain, as you're going to see, inshallah azwajal. Anyway, concerning the linguistic meaning, one of the greatest books that has been written in Arabic about the vocabulary in the Arabic language is the book that's called Lisan Al Arab. Lisan Al Arab. The tongue of the Arab. It was authored and written by one of the greatest scholars of Al Islam, especially in the language, and he is none other than Ibn Manzur. So, if a person wants to know the lihya that he can't cut, he wants to know what is that lihya, the beard, he'll go to this book, and this book will tell him and explain to him what was the lihya to the Arabs. He'll bring poetry, he'll bring a hadith. He'll bring ayahs of the Qur'an sometimes. Sometimes he'll just be bring poetry. Because the lihya or the beard, for an example, of the Arabs, is not what's on the man's cheek, it's not what's on his neck, it's not what's under his neck, it's what the Arabs made the tahdid of. So this book is extremely important for the student of knowledge. It's one of the ummahat kutub in the Arabic language. 
So when he came to the Mada of Salafa, seeing them, what is Salaf? What does it mean? He mentioned Rahmatullahi alayhi wa Salaf aydan, man taqaddamaka min abaika wa dhiwi wa dhawi aqaribik, alladhina hum fawquka fi sin wal fadr, wa lihada summiya as sadr al awwal min al tabi'een as Salaf al salih. He said that the meaning of Salaf in the Arabic language it is those people who have preceded you and they went before you in life. Those people from your fathers and from your relatives. Those people who are above you, older than you in age and better than you in virtue. He said, and this is why the beginning of the Muslims, the beginning, the first Muslim community, this is why they were called the Salaf al-Salih. The Tabi'un were called the Salaf al-Salih because they were older and they had higher position in virtues. So he is a man who gives the meaning of the word in Arabic and he also uses religiously what it is that the uh, concept is. So the issue of the meaning and who are the Salaf, then from those ulama of the language, this was no big problem to them. And even some of the scholars who were not following the way of the Salaf, some of the scholars who were not following the way of the Salaf, like the people of Ahlul Kalam, people from the Mu'tazila and the Asha'ira, even they were in agreement. What does it mean, this phrase, as Salaf al Salih? They didn't have any ikhtilaf, they didn't have any doubt about it. Like Al Imam al Ghazali, Al Imam Abu Hamid al Ghazali. He's a tremendous scholar in Al Islam. He wrote the book Ihya Ulum al Deen. He had Sufi tendencies and other things, but he was a good scholar overall. And I'm not here to put someone like that down. But nonetheless, scholars of Islam have categorized him as being from Ahlul Kalam, from the people of rhetoric, because of many of the positions that he took. Concerning the issue of uh, the righteous predecessors and the meaning of the word, and Imam al-Ghazali, he said about the kalima as-salaf, he said, it is madhab as-suhabati wa tabi'een. The word salaf means the madhab of the sahaba and the tabi'een. And he wasn't necessarily a person who was following the way of the salaf, but it just goes to show even people from Ahlul Kalam, they didn't have a problem with this word, they have a problem with this concept. Similar to them or him is another sheikh, who's not as well known as Al-Imam Al-Ghazali, and his name is Al-Bayjuri, Rahimahumullah Ta'ala. He said that the meaning behind As-Salaf, من تقدم من الأنبياء والصحابت والتابعين وتابعيهم. He said the meaning of those who are the Salaf, he said they are the ones who went before you and went before us from the prophets and from the companions and from the tabi'een as well as the followers of the tabi'een. Lastly, Ikhwani, another issue, and why, why are we dealing with this? Because some people have this feeling if they hear the word salaf or salafi or salafiyya, they get upset. They think that some people brought this word today. As I mentioned to you, some salafi person did something bad to him, did something that he didn't like, so he can't get beyond that. So he doesn't see the word salafiyya as an honorable word, like Muslim, for an example, like mu'min, like al-muhsin. It's not a word that's been made up. They even come and say they don't like it so much that they say the usage of the word is an innovation. Although the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was about to die, he said to his daughter Fatima al-Zahra, Ridwan Allahi alayha, fa'innuhu, he said, I am a good salaf for you, meaning I'm going to die before you. I'm going to die before you. So I'm a good salaf for you. So yeah, that word did come in the sunnah of the Nabi that is authentic. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what was collected by the Imam Ahmed and other than him, his other daughter, Ruqayya, Ruqayya, she was about to die, or actually she died. And the hadith said that the Prophet said to her, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Il Haqi bi Salafina as Salih, Uthmani bin Mavun. 
Now that you've died, my daughter Ruqayya, go and catch up. Go forward. You're dead. Go and catch up with our righteous predecessor, Uthman ibn Mad'un. May Allah be pleased with him. He was one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ who died. He died before Ruqayya, the daughter of Rasulullah ﷺ. So when his daughter died, he said to her in this particular hadith, go ahead and catch up to him because he's your salaf. He preceded you. So it's not acceptable for a person to hate the word. It's not acceptable. You have to get beyond the issue of what that person did to you. You got to get beyond the issue of what you don't like. This is not your group. So as a result of that, you don't like the word because as I mentioned, the scholars of the past, they were the ones who came up with this terminology and it was something that was widely accepted. Like with what happened with Al-Imam Al-Bukhari. Al-Imam Al-Bukhari Rahimahullah Ta'ala He said about a man by the name of Rashid Ibn Sa'd And Imam al-Bukhari used to talk about narrators He would say that this man is this, this man is that He was this, he was that And Imam al-Bukhari used to also Take from the knowledge of the people And say this was the position of so and so This was the position of so and so He was a tremendous scholar So he said about this man Rashid Ibn Sa'd he said that this man, Rashid ibn Sa'd, said, كان السلف يستحبون الفحولة لأنها أجرى وأجسر. He said, Rashid ibn Sa'd was from the Tabi'een. And this man, Rashid ibn Sa'd, said, the Salaf used to like the male camel when it came to fighting and jihad, when it came to racing, when it came to traveling. They used to like the male camel, not the female camel. They would like the fuhula, the male camel. And that is because they felt that the male camel was faster and the male camel was stronger. So the statement of Imam al-Bukhari, in that he said that the man Rashid ibn Sa'd said this, and Rashid ibn Sa'd is from the Tabi'in. So if a man from the Tabi'in, the second generation says, that the Salaf used to like these male camels, he's calling the companions the Salaf. So the man is from the Tabi'een. So how is a person going to come and say, this word just came up today. This word was just introduced, invented today. When people from the Tabi'een clearly used to say it, as Al-Imam Al-Bukhari brought in this particular issue. Another example of that is what Al-Imam Al-Bukhari brought again, and he said about Al-Imam Al-Zuhri. That's a name everybody should have heard before. And if you didn't, his name is Muhammad ibn Shihab Al-Zuhri. He's from the minor Tabi'een. He's from the minor Tabi'een. Meaning, he was taught by some of the middle and major Tabi'een. And the Tabi'oon were taught by the companions. So he was taught by the companions. Rahimahullah ta'ala. And Imam al-Bukhari said that and Imam al-Zuhri said concerning the bones that the people would find in the desert, like the bones of elephants, the bones of camels and horses, the bones that had been baked by the sun in the desert. And Imam al-Zuhri said that Adraktu nasin min salaf al-ulama yam tashituna biha an Imam Al Zuhri, who was from the Tabi'een, he said, I met some of the ulama of the Salaf, meaning the companions, because the man is from the Tabi'een. I met some of the ulama of the Salaf who said about these bones that it was no problem with these bones. If you crush them up, you can make oil from it. If the bone is there, you can chisel it out. And they would use it to comb their hair. Now this is not a fifth class. It's just going to show that the Salaf from the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, they didn't see the bone as being the jasa. That's the point. If there's an animal and the animal get his arm cut off and the arm is on the floor and that animal is living, that arm is najasa. If a part of the animal is cut off and he's still living, that thing that was cut off of him can't be eaten, can't be utilized. So what's the ruling? If we found the bones of an elephant, what does our religion say? And Imam Zuhri, 
Rahmatullahi alayhi, he said, the Salaf from the ulama that I met from the companions, they didn't have any problem with that. They used to use those bones to cut, to comb their hair, and they would grind it up, and after grinding it up, get the oil from the bones. So all of that, khwani, are examples, and there are many, many examples. The last one we want to give is Al-Imam Muslim, Rahmatullahi alayhi. Al-Imam Muslim, like Al-Imam al-Bukhari, he was one of those individuals who used to grade the men and grade the people. He was one of those individuals who used to as well say this was the position and the opinion of Abu Dawood and the opinion of Ishaq ibn Ibrahim Rahuya. This is the opinion of Al-Imam Malik and Al-Imam Ahmed. He was a collector and a gatherer of hadith and knowledge, statements and things that were said. So in talking about some of the people, he brought some kalam concerning what Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak from the ulama of al-Hadith, he's Amir al-Mu'minin al-Hadith, he was talking about a man, and that man's name is Amr ibn Thabit. Amr ibn Thabit. Al-Imam Muslim brought the narration of Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, one of the scholars of Islam. He said about this man, Amr ibn Thabit, da'u hadith, Amr ibn Thabit, fannuhu kani yasubbu as-salif. Don't take the hadith. Don't narrate the hadith of Amr ibn Thabit because he used to curse the salaf. Abdullah ibn Mubarak said that. And Imam Abdullah ibn Mubarak was doing the time of Imam Abu Hanifa. Don't take the kalam and the hadith of Amr ibn Thabit. Why? Is he a liar? No. But he's from the people of innovation. He is from the Rafid. He's from the Rawafid. Those people used to curse the Salaf, cursing the Salaf here means that he was cursing the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Alihi Wasallam Wa Radiallahu Anhum Ajma'in So that's the first issue Linguistically and religiously Who are the Salaf and what does it mean? Is this a word that we should hate? No Is it a word that Allah Ta'ala revealed in the Quran The way that we're using it? Be Salafi? No, Allah didn't use it like that did the Prophet say it like that? No. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But we are a people who have been commanded to take our religion from the scholars and what the scholars were in agreement upon, we shouldn't go against that. And as I showed you, none of the scholars of Islam in the past, none of them were predisposed or against the usage of this word. This issue of hatred started to come when groups came up, but none of the scholars of Islam said, there's any problem with using the word Salafi with the exception of the Rawafit, who their religion is, hating the companions, Ridwanullahi alayhim. Now very quickly we come to the other issue of the virtues of the Salaf, the virtues of those companions. And there are many adilla for that, but we're only going to share only a few. We already mentioned, Musabiqun al-awwaloon min al-muhajirin wal-ansar. That Allah is pleased with them and they're pleased with Allah. And he said, Those people who follow them with ihsan, Allah will be pleased with the followers of them, those people as well. So that shows the virtues of those companions and that Allah is pleased with all of them. There were some companions who drank khamr. There were some companions who committed zina. There were some companions who gambled. There were some companions who left Islam and came back to Islam. There were some companions who killed people. We say, anytime we hear their names, radiallahu anhum wa raduan. Why? Because Allah established that for them. There's not a single person sitting here today, nor your mother or your father, or the people who you come from, their loins, that you can say that Allah is pleased with anyone here. But Allah is pleased with those companions. And it is established in the Quran. So therefore, we don't have anything in our heart against any companion. As for people out here, it's permissible and it's possible that you may have something in your heart against someone here. He has something in his heart against his wife's brother or father because of the way they dealt with this situation. He has something in his heart because this guy stole his money. He has something in his heart because he has al-haqt and hasad. He's jealous, envious. It shouldn't be done. 
but it can happen as it relates to the companions it's not permissible for anybody here to have an iota any issue in his heart concerning the companion not anything and that's from their virtues not permissible Allah Ta'ala established in the Quran وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا اخْفِرْ لَنَا وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَا بِالْإِيمَانِ وَلَا تَجْعَلْ فِي قُلُوبِنَا غِلَّ لِلَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَا وَلَا تَجْعَلْ فِي قُلُوبِنَا غِلَّ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Our Lord, our Lord, forgive us because whenever the Muslim makes dua, he's going to always start with himself. This ayat of the Quran and many other ayat, Whenever you want to make dua, don't say to a person, may Allah bless you and bless us. You can say it, but it's better to say, may Allah bless us and bless you. So those people who came after the companions, they came after the companions. They say, oh, our Lord, forgive us and forgive our brothers who preceded us in Al-Iman. And don't allow there to be any rancor, animosity, enmity in our hearts towards those who believed. Radiallahu anhum. Nothing in your heart. So some of you come from places where the Shiite presence has affected your Islam and you may not know it. In the way we name ourselves. He doesn't curse the companions. He doesn't believe in that stuff. But he has a son, a brother, a cousin. His name is Fida Hussein. Ghulam Hussein. A lot of ta'thir. That man. The da'i. Uh... Zakir Naik, when the issue of the Prophet's companion Muawiyah, radiallahu anhu, when that issue came up and he praised Muawiyah, who was a companion, and Muawiyah had a fight with Ali ibn Abi Talib, and Ali is better than Muawiyah, but because there was that drama, there are those Muslims who have some Shiite tendencies, they don't like Muawiyah. So when Zakir Naik mentioned him in a talk, he started to go down in the eyes of many of the regular so-called Sunni uh, Asian community because he praised Muawiyah. You can't have anything in your heart against any of the companions. Not a single one of them. Whereas someone around here, it's possible you can have something in your heart. And you may have it for a good acceptable reason or for a wrong reason. You've got to get it out, but it's permissible. It may happen. With the companions, it's not permissible. From their virtues as well, is what Allah Ta'ala mentioned, and there are many ayat. Huwa alladhi ba'atha fil ummiyyin rasulan minhum yatlu alayhim ayatihi wa yuzakkihim wa yu'allimuhum al-kitab wal-hikmah wa in kanu min qablu la fi dolalan mubin wa al-akharina minhum lam yalhaqu bihim wa huwa al-azizu al-hakim Allah is the one who sent his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam to the unlettered people, the ummiyin. The Rasul came to those companions, the ummiyin, and he began to read to them the ayat of the Quran. And he began to purify them and gave them tazkiyah. Purify them with a tawhi, with a salah, with psalm and all that. They began to get pure with making the dhikr of Allah, making jihad, all of those sacrifices. And he taught them the book and he taught them the sunnah. Although before he came to them, they were all clearly astray. And then there's another group who haven't come yet. Another group of people haven't mentioned them, haven't met them yet, those companions. They haven't met them yet. And this is Allah who is Al-Azizul Hakim. So again, Allah mentioned the companions first, mentioned the Prophet coming to them, and he praised them. The Prophet ﷺ read to them directly the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Taught them directly the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And if someone were to ask one of you, did the Prophet ﷺ teach all of the Qur'an to the companions? What's the answer to that? Did the Nabi of Islam teach all of the Qur'an to the companions? Is there any ayat that he didn't teach? They had to learn it on their own, between themselves. Did the Prophet teach all of the Qur'an? Someone answer that question. Allahumma naam. There was no ayat of the Qur'an except that the Prophet Wasallam taught his companions everything. And it is mentioned in this ayat right here. He taught them the Qur'an. He taught them the sunnah. He gave them tazkiyah. 
and so forth and so on. So this is Allah praising them. And then he mentioned, and then there are some people, Lam yalhaqu bihim. Some people, they didn't, find, they didn't catch up to them because they came later. Whether it was the tabi'in, and then they came into the religion, or that's by tabi'in, or the people who came like us. So Allah Azza wa praised them. And secondarily, people who became Muslims, secondarily, after the companions, then they come to learn the Quran, the Sunnah, and they get tazki and so forth and so on. But primarily, it happened with the companions. From the hadith that clearly show their virtues, and there are a lot of a hadith, and this issue, wallahi, is from the asul of this religion. You're not a real Muslim if you don't comprehend the position of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Put aside making a big deal about the name and the words Salafiya, Salafiya. I make that a big deal. I think that's a big deal. It's part of the heritage that was passed down to us by the four imams of Islam and the ulama of al-Hadith. But we're not going to make a big deal about it. Put that name on the side. But what is a big deal? It's for every Muslim man, revert, every Muslim man and woman, Arab, non-Arab, rich, poor, white, black, whatever your case is, you have to see that the companions of this, of the Prophet's religion, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, anhum, they're not just a group of people who are nice and they have nice stories. They are the religion. You disconnect yourself from them, you disconnected yourself from this religion. You are in opposition to them. You have opposition to the religion. Something you are on the way that is, that is extremely misguided. And that's why the companions used to be approached by the tabi'een. And they wanted to praise them. The man came to Zayd ibn Aslam. He said, Ya Zayd ibn Aslam, Allah has blessed you. Allah has blessed you in that you made jihad with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. You read the Quran, he read the Quran and you prayed behind Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. You made hajj with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Tell me, tell me, who are the Ahlul Bayt? Who are the Ahlul Bayt? And then he went and told him, who are the Ahlul Bayt? But the reason why I mention that is what? That man came to him and he told him about his virtues and his virtues were what? You stood behind the Nabi and you heard his recitation. We have an imam. His recitation is nice. We're used to it and it's still nice. But how would the recitation be praying behind the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam? Someone in the audience right now, he has a problem. He's suffering some, from something and he's looking for a way out. After salat, he goes straight to the Nabi or even before. Rasulullah is coming to prayer. And he knows he is a man of rahmah. He goes up to him and whispers in his ear, I need to see you. I have this problem. And he can expect nothing but khair to come from the Nabi. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We don't have that now. Making jihad behind him. All of those issues. So those companions, they are much more than just some nice stories or some personalities. They are part of the religion. The Quran, part of the religion. The authentic sunnah, part of the religion. The way the companions understood those two sources, and we're going to come to that, the Ibn Allahi Ta'ala. As for the hadith that show their virtues, their virtues, and their meaning, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Alaihi Wasallam, and what was collected by Imam Bukhari, a Muslim, is Muttafiq Alaihi, there was some drama that transpired between Abdurrahman Ibn Awf, who was from the Sabiqeen al awwaleen from the Muhajireen. He had made hijra early on, embraced Islam in Mecca. He had a misunderstanding with the other companion, Khalid ibn Walid, who embraced Islam after Mecca was conquered. So Abdurrahman ibn Awf is better than Khalid ibn Walid because when we look at the companions, they are not all the same. The best one, Abu Bakr, Marathman, and Ali. And then after them, the other six that were promised Jannah. And from them, Abdurrahman ibn Awf. So when the companions had drama between themselves, it was natural. Allah forgave them for that. As for us having drama with them, and something, that's not permissible. That's not permissible. So Khalid ibn Walid, he said some words against Abdurrahman ibn Awf. He said, terrible tough words back 
because he heard from him. And the hadith, another narration came and said that the Nabi said, why did you say this to him? He said, because they talked about me. But anyway, when Khalid ibn Walid, who the Prophet described, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as a safe from the suyuf of Allah, he's a sword of Allah. It wasn't a joke. He says some things to Abdurrahman ibn Auf. When the Prophet heard that, he became angry. He told them, and it shows again the superiority and the virtues of the companions. لا تصبوا أصحابي فوالذي نفسي بيده لو أن أحدكم أنفق مثل أحد ذهب ما بلغ مد أحدهم ولا نصيفا I don't know any hadith after this hadith that should leave doubt in the mind of a Muslim who has aql and he has his intelligence. What, what do we say after this hadith? He said to Khalid ibn Walid, don't curse my companions, Khalid. Those who preceded you to this religion, you were fighting against me, and Abdurrahman ibn Auf was with me. He left Mecca and came to Medina, and with all that wealth, he gave it to me and put it at my disposal. Don't curse my companion, and you're the safe from the suyuf of Allah. You're in Jannah as well. Khalid ibn Walid was from the awliya of Allah. People were afraid of him. The Muslims, they didn't play around with Khalid ibn Walid and the non-Muslims. He would go to the battlefield of the non-Muslims and the Muslims would say, hey, don't eat this stuff. Some vegetables that would be out there. They say, don't eat it because the enemy, they poisoned it. They poisoned it. Khalid ibn Walid would take it and eat it and nothing would happen because he wasn't afraid of dying. His feast of being like he died, he was hungry, he ate it. He wasn't a joke. He said, before dying, here it is. I participated in all of these wars in Islam. There's not a place on my body except that I have a wound, a hole, from a sword, from an arrow, from a spear. I got holes all over my body. But here I am dying on a bed like an old fat camel. He didn't want to die in that way. He wanted to die on the battlefield. It wasn't a joke, that's the point. But he says something to Abdurrahman ibn Auf. Rasulullah said, don't curse my companions, Khalid ibn Walid. I swear by Allah, if one of you were to spin the likes of Mount Uhud in gold, you wouldn't reach half of a mud or mud that one of them have spent fi sabirillah. So that's what he said to Khalid ibn Walid. How can anybody in his right mind have any doubt? That for a person to come after those companions from the tabi'in and to say something bad about them, something's wrong with your religion. And that's why the scholars of Islam, they used to say, we hold our tongues back from talking about the companions in any bad way. Anything, any point you're trying to make, you want to make the point, we don't blindly follow the companions. If you want to make that point, Say it in the best way possible because you and I, we shouldn't allow anything to come out of our mouths where the companions, it could be understood, you're throwing disparaging remarks on them. One of the great personalities in Al-Islam, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he was from the best of the tabi, not the best, but from the best. He wasn't a companion. He was a descendant of Umar ibn al-Khattab. He did a lot of good in Islam, a lot. And Imam Ahmed said he was the fifth rightly guided Khalifa. The ulama of Islam said the dust, the dust that accumulated in the nostrils of the companions when they used to walk for jihad, when they used to travel for Umrah, Hajj, the dust that used to come up in their nose, it was more precious than Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. And Umar Abdul Aziz is a tremendous personality. Why did they give that analogy in that example? Just to show this man is serious. Al Hassan al Basri, these people are serious from the Tabi'in. Uwais al Qarni, the best of the Tabi'in. These people are serious. But when you compare them to the Bedouin from the companions who came to the masjid and urinated in the Prophet's masjid, he's better than Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. The companion lady that committed zina and got a baby as a result of that and then was stoned to death, is better than Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. No human being, no human being can do enough work, or do enough to catch up to the companions. No human being. They're the best of the people because of the suhbah, being a companion. 
So if someone asks you this question, if an individual came in the world today, he had the ability to sit with all of the rulers of the West, and he gave them Dawid Allah, and they all collectively, in a unified way, embraced Islam and started practicing Islam and started ruling by what Allah revealed. They built masjids, they took care of the orphans, they helped Islam. Someone was responsible for that by Allah's permission. Is he better than the Bedouin that urinated in the masjid? The answer is no, he's not better than him. The Mahdi, when he comes back, if the Mahdi came back today, right now, all of this vulm that's going on in the world, all of this vulm, he's going to make peace and rectify the whole world. All of this that's going on, the economic vulm, social vulm, religious vulm, all of this stuff that's going on, by Allah's permission, he's going to fix it up. Is he better than the companion who urinated in the masjid? The one who committed adultery and had a baby? May Allah Ta'ala be pleased with them all. The answer is no, no. And you have to get your head around that. That has to be inside of your mind and your heart. There's nobody, no one who can be better than the companions with the exception of the prophets and the messengers. Ridwanullahi alayhim ajma'in. When they come back, when Isa ibn Maryam comes back, he's going to be better than, he's better than everybody other than the prophets that were mentioned by the Quran and the Sunnah. Last point that we want to make, inshallah, before we deal with this salat, is that there are some hadith that suggest some people can be better than the companions from this audience. There are some hadith like that. Like the hadith about the statement of Allah Ta'ala, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu alaykum anfusukum. لا يضركم من ضل إذا اهتديتم. Oh, you believe you are responsible for your own selves. It doesn't hurt you or harm you. Those who go astray, as long as you are guided aright. So, if a Muslim is living and people around him are doing bad things, he can't do bad. And he says, "Well, they doing it, so I'm doing it back to him." No. It doesn't hurt you. Those who go astray, as long as you're doing the right thing, you have to do the right thing. So one of the tabi'een, he asked the companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the meaning of this particular ayat. What does it mean? And that companion is Abu Tha'lab Abu al-Khushani. He said, what is the meaning of this ayat? What's the meaning of it? Does it mean alaykum and fusukum that when, when, when there's munkar and bad things going on, I don't say anything, I just worry about myself. I don't say anything. Because I have to be responsible for myself. Don't say anything. Does it mean that? Abu Tha'laba, Ridwanullahi alayhi, he said, no, it doesn't mean that. Because the Prophet ﷺ told us what it meant. And it's a quite a long hadith, but part of the hadith is that he said, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, فَإِنَّ مِنْ وَرَائِكُمْ أَيَامُ الصَّبْرُ الصَّبْرُ فِيهِنَّ مِثْلُ قَبْدْ عَلَى الْجَمْرِ Rasulullah said, وسلم, there's a time that's coming where there's going to be a lot of fitna. That a person who's going to be religious and he's going to hold on to Islam, he's going to be like the one who's holding on to the hot coals that are bothered, that burning him. So anyone doing this tough time when it's coming, Anyone, anyone who has sabr, anyone who has sabr during this time, he's going to get the reward of 50 of you companions. He's going to get the reward of 50 of you companions. When the companions heard that, some of the people thought that the Prophet made a mistake. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what he said in his ta'bir, that maybe he meant to say he's going to get 50 rewards of the people who are living during the time of that one who's having sabr during the time of fitna. So they say, Ya Rasulullah, you mean he's going to get the reward of 50 who are with him? He said, no. He'll get the reward of 50 people from amongst you. That hadith, someone could read it and someone could think, hey, he's getting the reward of 50 of the companions so he could be better than the companions. Doesn't mean that. And none of the ulama gave that interpretation. 
And again, this is the importance of the language, and this is the importance of looking at the asalib or the teaching methods of the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Everybody here knows that he's the best Benny Adam, but he used to tell the people, "Don't put me over Yunus. Don't say that I'm better than Yunus, and he's better than Yunus." He knows he's better than Yunus, and he told us he's better than Yunus. But he had a steep teaching style. He wants to show the reward of the people who have sabr during the time of fitna. So the meaning of the hadith is not that the person now can reach the companions. Another hadith similar to it, he said to his companions, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I can't wait until I see my companions. They said, aren't we your companions? He said, no, you're my brothers. My companions are the people who haven't come yet, but they're going to believe in me. So someone reads that hadith and he walks around and he says, I'm from the companions of Rasulullah. So you should say, radiallahu anhu, when you mention my name. Hadith is not talking about that. That was the Prophet showing the people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how he wanted just to raise the people. So the companions, when it came to this religion, they passed us in everything, in everything. But there may be a person who's living during the time of fitting and drama and he's holding on to his religion if you hold on to your religion at this time, you'll get a tremendous reward because the time is not like the time of the companions, so to say, so to speak. He told his companions, you people, you my companions, you're living in the time when there are many ulama and very few people give speeches. Anyone who, anyone who leaves a tenth of his religion, he leaves Anyone who leaves 10th of his religion is going to go astray. He said there's going to come a time when there's going to be a lot of people who give speeches and only a few ulama. He said anyone who holds on to just a 10th, if the companions would have abandoned a 10th, they would go astray. They had to hang on to 95, 98% of their religion. The time of fitness is going to come. If a person is holding on to 10% of his religion, he'll be rightly guided. So that's what he was talking about, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And he wasn't talking about that anybody today can reach up to the companion. Something that's impossible. And this is from the aqidah of Ahl sunnah The fact that no human being can do anything that will equal the suhba. Being from the ashab of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it wasn't in the hands of the companions. It was in their hands to do this in jihad, to do that, and to spin here, and to, that was in their hands. So they became more and, and had superiority over others. But being chosen as a companion, that wasn't in their hands. Allah Azza wa chose them divinely. And as a result of that, no one, nobody, no matter what he does, the Mahdi, no one, the Tabi'een, there are great Tabi'een who have more knowledge than certain companions. They have more knowledge, but they're not better than the companions of رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وسنقتفي بهذا القدر إلى نصلي صلاة العشاء إن شاء الله عز وجل وبعدها نستأنف الدرس السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته